Hey, and welcome to Slice of Security. My name is Kyle McKay. This is episode two. In this episode, we're going to be joined by James Cairns, security lead from Bow Valley College, with whom I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity in a post-secondary, Greenfield security programs, and some lessons learned, as well as B-Sides Calgary 2020. And in this episode, we're also going to be sharing with you a trait that we believe the best security professionals all share. So why don't you grab yourself a slice and join us for episode two, coming right up. Welcome everybody to a slice of security. This is episode number two. Today we're joined by James Cairns. It's Cairns, means pile of rocks in Scottish. Pile of rocks. He is a lead of IT security. Uh, working for Bow Valley College. So That's I'll great. throw it to you. Maybe if you don't mind just doing a quick intro. Well, first off, thanks for having me, Kyle. I really appreciate uh, getting the opportunity to be on the show with you. Okay. Um, been at uh, Bow Valley College for, oh, go, about 15 years now. And my my progression to into IT security has been um, a bit of a longer road. I have moved, initially started as a developer and started to see uh, cybersecurity um, from the aspect of, of development and building secure code, and then moved on to working, being a specialist in ERP systems. From there, I moved into uh, the DBA role, and DBA was more, more of DBA plus server ops plus security, um, and really started get transitioning into security over the last probably four or five years. And then just in this last year, have I moved full time into uh, cybersecurity? Let's get to know you personally just a little bit. So one of the things for me personally, I'm a huge movie guy. I love movies. My question for you is: Do you also share my hobby or my enjoyment of movies? And if so, what would be your favorite movie? I uh, yes, I do. My, I'm gonna say my favorite movie is actually a trilogy. Okay. I mean, and maybe it's, it's common for for a lot more of introverts or <laughs> uh, or, or, or IT guys. Um, is actually Lord of the Rings. I, a little bit of a fun fact for me, I actually, um, after the, the Lord of the Rings was, was filmed, I moved with my wife to New Zealand for about a year, just to be down there and be in the, be in the country that uh, it was filmed in, because I was that much of a fan. So you moved there just for that? That was the main reason? Pretty much. We, we didn't have kids at the time, and it was just something that was just, you know, it was an adventure for us. Yeah, so we had the opportunity to do that, and it was, I, I have to say, it's, it's one, of the, one of the greatest things that I've ever done that way. I mean, beyond having a family. So I was going to also ask you what your favorite book was, but I almost feel like it's going to be the same answer. It's going to be the same answer. I mean, I, I was thinking about that because my favorite movie definitely is that my books, the books that I would always say come before the movies. Um, if you're going to say what's my second favorite movie, just to give it a bit of a different answer, I would say, um, the, the, the remake of the Italian job, oh, just really? love the cars, you know, love, love that side of it as well. And, uh, okay. yeah, so. in terms of hobbies, what kind of things do you like to do? Um, I'm really, I've always grown up with a lot of different hobbies. So I do everything from, I've done some woodwork, some kind of fine woodworking up to I've built a, a kitchen table. Wow. Actually, I like to write occasionally, um, still kind of fitting into that, uh, fantasy genre a little bit hmm. um right now the thing that i'm doing right is uh basically we've taken an old 1974 holiday trailer and fixing that up and and both on the outside and inside and and getting that ready to go so i i, I do a bit of bit of everything and, and just kind of things that uh, keep my mind sharp and, and not just in it Amazing. Yeah, you've got many skills and many hobbies. You're a busy guy with uh, three kids too, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I get my kids helping with the, with the stuff like, That's like the RV as well. Yeah. Amazing. This one's probably difficult for most people to answer, so feel free to take your time, or you can just not answer it at all if you want. Sure. But do you have a most influential person or potentially a resource that perhaps has been most influential on you or you or your career? There has been so many large influences for me in my career. Um, I was going to say my first boss that I ever had was, was at uh, Bull Valley College, at, coming, out of, uh, coming out of college, actually. Hmm. Um, and it was a really uh, a, a boss that just worked alongside me, uh, nice. really was, was believed in me more than I did at the time, you know, 
That's amazing. And and so that that definitely brought me forward. I'm I'm going to say all my supervisors that I've had over the years have actually just helped me move my career forward and, and thought of me in, in high regard, it feels like, and, and, and allow me to, to grow at a, at, a, at a rate that I never would have thought possible. I also um, had the opportunity uh, probably about six years back now to um, work out, outside of IT kind of in, in, in a board and, and being able to have some coaches that came alongside me there and, and did a lot of things that were, you know, non, not IT specific. Got to be a little, look at leadership and what it means to be a leader. How can you be a leader even if you don't have a title of that? So yeah, there's been a lot of, I'm not going to say no one influential person. It's, it's just a, uh, being blessed to have many influential people over the years. Now, your favorite pizza toppings. Getting into the theme of this show, we're obviously cybersecurity, but can't forget about pizza. So what, uh, what would be some of your favorite toppings on, on your pizza? Growing up as a kid, I would, I would have said like pineapple and that was it, right? Like that was, you know, I think that probably was most kids or a lot of kids would say, you know, having Hawaiian and having pineapple. Yep. As I've got older and, and palates matured a little bit more, actually a couple things are spiced peppers and either where they're pickled or not, or don't actually donair meats too. Yes. So, yeah. Great answer. Donair meats is, uh, not very well known, but yeah. if you have a Donair pizza, I would advise anybody out there who has never tried one to absolutely give that a shot. It's surprisingly good. Quick trivia question. Where was Hawaiian pizza first invented or first created? How specific are we supposed to get to? I'm going to be, you're going to see me trying to use my phone or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're as specific as you want. I mean, obviously earth is the easy answer there, but. Earth is the easy answer. I would say in the U.S., but I'm not going to... Everybody would say, oh, it's Hawaii, but I don't think it would be that. That seems too obvious, right? It seems too obvious. So yes. So I'm at a loss. U.S. is a good, good, good answer, but surprisingly, it was created first in Canada. Oh, really? Wow. The story goes something like um, a gentleman who ran a pizza parlor was getting bored of these typical toppings, and one day he, I guess, had a can of, can of pineapples or he was struck by this, this brilliant idea and he threw it on pizza and I guess the rest is history. What is your favorite pizza or perhaps better worded, what is the best pizza you've ever had and where was it from? Uh, it, I mean, it sounds bad. It sounds like I'm, I'm being a politician or being very political here. <laughs> it depends what you're, you're looking for. I mean, if you're looking for like a thin crust, really um, Italian type pizza with... What would be the type of pizza you typically favor? Would it be the the thin crust, the thick crust, the Sicilian. Do you have a, any kind yeah, of favorite? I would say probably the thick crust. Um, thick crust with a good a good marinara, not too much, and um, you know, make sure it's it's fairly meat heavy. I am I like the protein <laughs> and and that, but yeah, the, normally if you see if you'd ever see me make a pizza, it's normally mounted about four inches high with with everything on it. All right, so now it's time for the portion of this show where we cover. The surprise pizza themed questions. Okay. So James did not have any idea that these questions, what these questions are. So this is a nice, nice little surprise. We're going to watch the uh, reflection in his glasses to make sure he's not Googling anything. <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is what are the top five days of the year for pizza sales or pizza orders? Boxing Day, because my, my theory is that everybody's had turkey, and so the next day they just want to have something and don't want to think about cooking. Same thing I'm going to say probably, I'm going to say maybe around New Year's Eve, it might be something that people might, you know, gravitate to. Oh, the, the, the rest, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit about, at a loss. That's perfectly. I'm really, really interested to know what, which ones they are. You got one of them for sure, which was New Year's Eve. Okay. Surprisingly, New Year's Day as well is another, uh, another one of the top five. The other answers are Halloween. All right. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Wow. Uh, and then the other one is um, a Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. Since you watched the last episode, which thank you, by the way, uh, we covered what are the core five ingredients in a pizza dough recipe. So my question for you, what would be the top five core or necessary ingredients, in your opinion, that a cybersecurity professional should have? So the first one I'm gonna say is that 
you, you've got to be hungry. I'm going to say hungry for knowledge, hungry to, to learn new things. That, that I think is, is the first thing because I think the, the field changes and, and continues to change so rapidly. Uh, another trait I would say that is, is huge for, for somebody in cybersecurity is it's not just being hungry, but the willingness to learn and, and realize that your, your learning doesn't stop whenever you get, whether it's, it's a certification, whether it's a degree, diploma, or whatever you're, you're dealing with, but it's looking at, you know, looking at it as, as, as a growth and a continual growth area until, until you've done your career in cybersecurity. The ability to be able to, to talk to business needs. So being able to, to speak in, in, in business needs as well as highly technical needs and be able to translate between those. That is definitely a trait that, that or experience it, that, that you, you will need um, because it's translating your, um, your, your technical and tactical goals to, mm -hmm. to business over time is, is something that you'll, you'll need to uh, be able to, to well enunciate well and, and, and describe what's going on to, to a varied group of people. Also to be able to um, put your, really put yourself in the mindset of, of the different stakeholders. So not just talking from, from the endpoint of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but rather talking from, you know, the stakeholders that, you know, may, might see, see cybersecurity not as actually something that, that's part of their role. Um, oh, good point. So you have to be able to put your, your basically see where, where stakeholders come. You know, I think a lot of people, when, when they're not cybersecurity professionals, they'll see cybersecurity as just, you know, that roadblock or something yeah. that does stop stop what they're trying to do. And you have to understand where the friction points are and, and encourage them to be able to, to step past them. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. That's actually uh, interesting. Would it be fair to say that the word for that may be, in part at least, uh, the ability to be empathetic to some degree? To Absolutely. Yes, that's, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, because that's that's actually a very interesting point, and I, that's that's something that I've I've often seen where you know people put that cybersecurity hat on, and then that's it, right? They they don't really care anymore about these other business initiatives or these business needs, these stakeholders. They're not putting themselves in in their shoes to understand okay, all of these new barriers that I've introduced or all of these new logistical hurdles, perhaps. Which you know that's not always the case, but often it is. You know, well, what does that mean to them? Mm -hmm. And how do we work together to make that a little bit less of a, a nightmare, perhaps, right? Because if you have that empathy, which is exactly what, what I believe you're describing, and, and I think we're on the same page there, then uh, you're going to be able to at least put yourself in their shoes and, and try to try to work with them. I, I think what it is, is it's a lot of it maybe going back and drawing on experience of, of your, you know, whoever it may be yeah. in cybersecurity back on their own life, you know. Not everybody will have started in cybersecurity or, you know, grow up just cybersecurity. It's been the only thing. So thinking back to childhood, thinking back to, you know, previous, you know, careers, you know, different viewpoints and making sure you're bringing that forward. Yeah, I love that. That's it. That's great because I completely agree. Having that experience to fall back on, you have now a different perspective, right? Now you, now you can, in fact, put yourself in their shoes because maybe you were partially in that position before. And so, you know, if somebody imposed these new restrictions or if somebody uh, re suggested this sort of idea that, you know, it was under was under the best intentions, it's for security, but it's not practical, right? It's not it's not realistic. If you just had that cybersecurity hat without that depth of experience, that's perhaps the conundrum you'll, you'll find yourself in as a, as a security professional, right? We've been waiting long enough. Well, for sure you have. So today we have Boston Pizza Pizza, El Dorado. James, does yours look anywhere similar to this? It does, it looks delicious. Beautiful. So we're gonna do this without sliding it off the plate. That looks good. All right, so El Dorado. We've got, I think, some Italian sausage. I see some onions, jalapenos, of course, some mozzarella, and I think some fresh tomatoes and ground beef actually so it's a nice fully loaded pizza all right i'm going for my first bite let's take a look okay not bad good level of flop it's not yeah. too fatty, not too greasy 
Mm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. It's kind of sweeter than I expected it right off the bat. It is a little bit sweeter. I agree. Oh. Good flavor, though. I, I'm always a sucker for jalapenos. Yes, me too. Can't go wrong with that. First impressions are pretty good. Mm -hmm. Good level of heat. Toppings are pretty flavorful. It's, a, it's enough heat to just add to the flavor, not just yeah. overpower it, which is great. Exactly. So we already talked a little bit on your background at Bow Valley College, how you got there. Um, we talked a little bit about how that background and that experience that you've gained as a result of that has really, and at least from what I can tell, and I'm, you know, I'm sure your colleagues could probably attest to it too if they were here. I'm sure that's helped you gain a lot more empathy for those other groups. Is there any area of cybersecurity in particular that you tend to focus on? I, I presume because you're, you're a fairly small team, you're probably having to wear most of, not, if not all of those hats, but in terms of your, your education and your background and your passion, is there any one particular area that you're focused on? Um, I'm actually going to say th three. I mean, definitely, I think there's a, a, there's definitely always a tendency to draw towards one and that's, you know, working definitely towards some vulnerability management and, um, making sure that's that's it's kind of the the easy thing especially when you look at it as from a system and what's broken what can we do it how can we fix it mm -hmm. and so that's definitely where i keep together and i'm going to use an, an acronym I, just to make it helps me remember is pi people identity and endpoint and that's those are the three places where i, I like to focus on huh. um you know people a lot around you know, talking about phishing and and dealing with how can we secure, uh, secure the person the identity you know looking at behaviors how you know, when people log in, how they log into services, what's their access, and then again back to that endpoint, and how do we secure the endpoint? Did you make that acronym yourself, or did that you hear that somewhere else? It was just just something that just from experience of, of the three things I need to make sure that I always focused on, actually to make sure that I didn't do one or the other. Got to think if you invested your time and effort in those three categories, you'd be in pretty damn good shape, I'd think, right? Well, you you hope so. <laughs> yeah. You never want to be that statistic, but you always always realize it's it's a, a game of not if it happens, but when it happens, and then how do we deal with it? Then. How many individuals do you have on the security team today? So uh, are you a solo, or do you have a small small team? I'm going to I'm going to say yes to that. So it's 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 basically I'm um, saying so it's it's a team of, of one right now, but I'm going to say a huge asterisk on that because. The work that's been done and the tactical work and has definitely crossed multi, multiple teams and multiple individuals throughout IT. And without them, you know, what I'm, what we've been looking forward at as strategy and, and things we're trying to accomplish would not have been done without them. So I have to say kudos and thanks to them because that's that's where you know the rubber really hits the road. Is you know there's you know there's only so much that one person can do. So true. It's a team effort, isn't it? It has to be because uh, there, the, you know, when you're looking at what what can go wrong, it's it it's just so huge that you you can't do it by yourself. All right, James, we have dined on this delicious Boston pizza El Dorado tonight. Very interesting flavor, great great ingredients, a little bit of spice, a little bit of sweet. Overall, quite good. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to you for the first uh, rating. On this show, we rank it uh, from zero to 10. If you can provide us any any rationale as to why you gave it that rating, any any feedback and how it compares, uh, some of your other favorites, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I would probably give it an eight, eight and a half out of 10. Um, just the right amount of marinara with it, not too much cheese for the for the amount of spice. And then the the meat toppings with it and the, the jalapenos just give it that nice uh, spice package that just finished it off. It was, it was great. And then also with the crust, it was just the, it wasn't too thick of a crust to, to take away from it. And it was great. So for me personally, uh, I enjoy the pizza. Like I said, great, great spice to um, sweet ratio. There's something really good about that. I mean, I am a sucker for, for spicy. So they are going to, I am going to give this a better score than maybe it deserves admittedly, but it's my show. So I can make the rules. Undercarriage, as you can see here, nice, decent undercarriage. Could be a little bit uh, more cooked, perhaps, but overall good. The flop was quite good. It wasn't too um, too greasy and too too floppy. Uh, so my score on this guy is going to be a 7.2. All right, James, pizza review is complete. Some good pizza, some good conversation so far. But there's probably uh, quite a few 
people that have uh, only tuned in to hear some of the cybersecurity related content. So what do you say we get into some of that? One of the themes that we're going to be covering in this episode today, well, there's two kind of two broad themes that we're going to hopefully tackle uh, time permitting. One would be post-secondary specific. So trying to understand a little bit more around what are, what are the most common threats a post-secondary institution could face? What are some of the attacker motivations? Um, those kinds of things. Then we're also gonna shift from there to talk a little bit more around this Greenfield security program that you've essentially stewarded and, and it started perhaps from, from nothing to where it is now and then share that experience with, with others. I used to work at a post-secondary uh, institution, uh, MRU in particular, but I wasn't in a security role at the time. So my question for you is, what are some of the most common threats and, and attacks that a post-secondary might face? Sure, I might delineate them too, but I'm going to say delineation between staff and faculty-based uh, threats and more kind of around that and then students as well. Yeah, good idea. Um, so if we're looking at students, uh, there's, there's a couple things. One. Um, one that we look at is, is protecting their input and, and that's sometimes is a very hard thing because you're doing a lot of um, kind of a large scale BYOD deployment. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you provide services not, but other than endpoints that you, you maintain yourself. Some, some of the big issues that we, we see is, you know, def, definitely the larger scale looking at um, the concern about ransomware, um, you know, ransomware not on not only on, on corporate, but definitely on, st on students because it because it is either their own devices that are being brought in, and there's also the more the larger academic freedoms um, that you want to make sure that you ensure for your students. The other side of it too is is being able to validate that you know uh, a student on your network is actually is a student you know bad actors that they're still looking for defacement and. Then, and a perfect place for defacement is definitely in a post-secondary institution. It's you have a large amount of people that you're going to be, you know, affecting potentially, and you, you get your, you, you, there's the potential that you can get your your message or or your, your what you've done out in front of a lot of people quite quickly. Yeah, good point. Things like crypto jacking, and not very many people talk to that, but that's the interesting thought is you know when you're providing you know BDI infrastructure, for example, what. A, a fractional slowdown uh, uh, per per VM, mm. you know, can can actually contribute to a quite a large um, amount of, of traffic on on your your endpoints that where where you you figure that you're going to be providing services to to X amount of of, of students on, on these endpoints and you're actually you know decreasing by five ten percent it contributes to a huge amount of operational cost. So that's something that definitely looking at you know anything that's persistent on on the endpoint that you know will especially protect not not just privacy and security but performance as well. Staff and faculty, it's totally different. You know, focus. You're looking at anything from student information systems to you know ERPs. You know, you you got your HR and finance records as well. It depends on on the institution, but it could be some some quite extensive research. So anything from intellectual property that you're trying to protect to improper access on, on databases to, you know, which has definitely has been def very near and dear to my heart over the years. Given that, James, what would be some of the most common or, I guess, predicted uh, motivations that an attacker would perceive for these attacks against a post-secondary institution? So definitely stemming back to notoriety. Notoriety definitely is a big thing. Again, a lot of that you know, monetary gain when you're looking at student information systems, you're looking at not normally just you know current students, but you're looking at alumni and and it can be quite a large uh, database and large uh, set of data that you know could be used for you know monetary gain, could be used for identity theft and and snowball from there as well. Yeah, good point. When it comes to you as either wearing your security security lead hat, which is obviously the the role you're currently in. Uh, or whether it's just you in, in any of the roles that you've been in uh, in the past. Uh, have you historically or do you currently collaborate with other post-secondary institutions to share knowledge, best practices, um, kind of what you're seeing out there? Is there a forum to do that in the post-secondary space? And, and if not, is that something you take uh, initiative to do? That's actually a really good question. And I, I know over the years and where I've seen there, there has been collaboration between post-secondaries. It's, it's definitely morphed and, and changed, you know, as, as I'm going to say as all post-secondaries mature, mm -hmm. um, including yours, you know, where, where we didn't have a dedicated cybersecurity space to now we do. Um, 
we, we, we see a lot of post-secondaries following that same path with us, either just, you know, just ahead of us, there's some that are very mature in the process, or, you know, just kind of behind where we're at right now. And so there's actually been a, a really good group of individuals at, at the same, in the same roles as, as I am in right now, where we've been, where we've been working together towards how do we communicate better. Oh. Uh, you know, there, there has been things that we really communicated well with the government of Alberta, and now how do we make sure that we're communicating, you know, on threats? We've, we've dealt with this this way. How do we, you know, deal with playbooks? You know, how do we handle things, you know, in a consistent manner across all the secondary? So it's really changed actually over in the last year. Um, and and I, I see a, a, a genesis that will, you know, this will continue on and, and mature definitely between. In the private sector, there's typically a little bit more um, hesitancy around sharing much information uh, between organizations. But that's the beauty of post-secondary, at least when I worked there. And I think that's a pretty normal thing where post-secondary institutions aren't so concerned about sharing information with other post-secondary institutions because, you know, we're all typically public sector institutions. We're hopefully striving for the same goal of better education for our students. So that, that's really encouraging to hear that that is taking place because I got to think that an attack against any other institution in the world is probably going to be repeated against other institutions in that same vicinity or in that same region, whether it happens right away or sometime in the near future. Uh, I got to think that those lessons learned and those, the steps that, for example, you've maybe taken to mitigate something or another institution has taken to mitigate something, those should be repeatable practices. I, I, would, I would say that, you know, the thought around a lot of, and you see it a lot in private sector and, and it's no fault of private sector, um, that you know, secrecy does not equal security. Um, the you know how we do security doesn't really change. You know, from you know, a phishing attempt is a phishing attempt is a phishing attempt. How do you deal with that? That that side of things doesn't really change. What does change is you know when you're looking at is, is maybe intellectual property and how you want to make sure that your intellectual property is secure. How you do business there there's variances and in, in different institutions will do it differently, but you're still going to all be ingesting threat intelligence. You're all going to be making sure your endpoints are protected and that your people are protected. You're going to be making sure that you're looking at identity management and multi-factor authentication. Those things don't really, there's, there's not a, a huge uh, variance with, you know, yeah. within even not, you not even in our vertical, but in, in any other vertical. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it, when you start looking at a security program, you're looking strictly at secrecy around how you do security. I think you're, you're going to, you're going to see that fall flat on its face. There have been some pretty high profile um, breaches and attacks that have hit the post-secondary landscape over the last couple of years. Uh, we won't name any institutions. As a result of those, I'm sure you, those were incidents that you were made aware of at some point. Were there any learnings perhaps that, that you were able to glean from those uh, those incidents or attacks? First, the, the, always the first and selfish thing is, is you always go, I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> and, and it's always, the thing is, the thing about that is it's always, when you're looking at that, is I'm glad it isn't me, or at least if you're really thinking about it, and, and if we're going to get breached, when we're going to get breached, you know, looking about how can we, you know, mitigate that going forward. So, you know, when you're looking at you know, ransomware attacks and you're looking at fraudulent activity, it's definitely a, a, as horrible as it is for the other institutions. It gives you a, a lot of focus and normally from not just, you know, not just IT, not just even uh, you know, anybody in, in staff and faculty, but executive, and, and actually it's, it's a large viewpoint where, you know, a, a light is shone towards, I'm going to say, post-secondaries and saying how we're doing this. And that actually is, is a good thing. You know, again, getting out of that secrecy mindset and, and looking at it, how do we, as, as a, you know, post, all post-secondaries handle this better? Are we making sure that, you know, our, you know, our security operations, how, how are we centralized? Are we decentralized? What makes sense? that's that's definitely it gives gives that that light on us in, in a good sense because now you're having your stakeholders asking the tough questions which need to be asked to cybersecurity. when it comes to cybersecurity at uh, Bull Valley you guys you guys teach a cybersecurity um, I think it's a certificate correct that's correct we're just starting up into that we've just due to um, just how things have changed we'll be starting in the fall or, or yeah. anticipating starting in the fall very cool that's exciting is there a, an element to your role uh, currently? That, do you have any involvement in that? Um, is there any precautions that maybe have perhaps needed to be put in place? So I got to think there's some inherent risk perhaps of having that kind of activity going on on campus. So is that something you've been involved with at, at this point? Yeah, 
That's a good question. Actually, so I've had uh, really good chats and, and have had some good, really good feedback between uh, the lead instructor and our program chair around that program. Um, it's been really, really quite neat to be able to, to walk alongside them and say, hey, this is how, what we're doing you know, corporately. How can we do this to teach? And so you know, providing that, that space for the, the, the students and, and the learners is, is definitely paramount for us. We want to make sure that they have an environment that, that they can, you know, as, as, as much as you know, we're, we're protecting you know, them, them and us you know, as, as, they, as they learn, um, but it also gives them that environment where they're able to be, it's able to be flexible enough and tinker and you know, to, to you know, experience things and, and see things and how, how, as, as close to you know, real world as possible. Very cool. Well, I'm sure they'll be knocking on your door at some point to guest speak or, uh, or something if I had to guess, but be... And I'd, I'd be more than happy to see the, the the students come out and do work experience with us and be able to, to yeah. see how things work and you know and get that that experience to the, for them as they as they get out through the program. That's a great idea. It's no better way to learn than seeing the the real thing, isn't there? Absolutely. <laughs> when it comes to I guess student the student uh, population at BBC, you guys always from what I gleaned just from what you mentioned a, a few moments ago. You guys do provide some level of uh, equipment to some students, right? For probably certain programs, you have to provide a, a laptop that has all of the prerequisites and so on and so forth. You, you did mention also that some, to some degree, there's some endpoint controls that you have to, to actually put onto those devices. So there's on a grant on the grand scheme of things, how much involvement would you say is is devoted to the student side of of uh, your of the Bow Valley College, I guess? versus what you spend on faculty and staff and, and the rest of it? I'm gonna say that um, from an aspect of, of high touch, it's definitely a higher touch with, with staff and faculty and not, not, you know, not any reason why this happens that way, other than I'm gonna say with the student body, the student body is that much larger. So a lot of the service that you're providing is definitely a lot more automated. You're using a lot of tool sets that way that you can to, to reach a, a larger audience. And we still do see, we will see um, you know, instances where we're, we're dealing with them in more higher touch and it's dealing around, you know, academic honesty okay. um, and places like that where we're lo definitely looking into looking at, at uh, incident response, essentially. So we definitely would, would see more um, with the students when we're dealing with an incident response situation than um, your, your normal operations, you know. In your opinion, based on what you've seen, what do you think makes cybersecurity in a post-secondary institution versus other verticals? unique? I would say it's because it is a, an incorporation of many verticals when you look at it. It's not just, you know, you're, you're dealing with students, you're dealing with, you know, PCI compliance, you're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with privacy, you know, the flight back. Um, you're looking at potentially with, with a lot of, with some post-secondaries too, where they have a um, business development unit that is looking at, you know, different areas of revenue that don't fall directly under normal school operations it's more research based and so you're dealing with you know not just research not just you know corporate and it, it's definitely there's there's multiple verticals that you're trying to, to protect all at once so that's what i'm going to say that's what makes my job so special is that you know i can be i can spend a lot of time looking at one specific um you know a, a tactic mm -hmm. and and realize that you know you know it's, it has to be kind of spread across things and, and doing everything well is this definitely makes it makes it quite interesting my goodness. Yeah. When you put it like that, that certainly sounds like it's a pretty broad field of cybersecurity that you're uh, inevitably going to be responsible for at a post-secondary compared to perhaps uh, other verticals. Yeah, you definitely have to love the challenge and, and, yeah. and not to be in, be in cybersecurity in a post-secondary. I can see that. So post-secondaries, similar to what you really just mentioned, they're often siloed as kind of their own vertical as post-secondary. But as uh, as you just pointed out and as many could probably attest to you under that single silo or that single vertical you've got many branches many divisions as like you said maybe there's some R&D going on maybe there's some business development there's the faculty there's the students there's some retail some e-commerce uh, you're there's pretty much everything really uh, other than maybe some operational technology that uh, oil and gas may be dealing with that so how can someone possibly cover, or how can a team in, in, a, in a cybersecurity space, how can a team cover all of those different, uh, I guess, many verticals within banner of a post-secondary institution? 
you've already pointed out how that's a challenge in its own right because you're, you can't be necessarily be an expert in e-commerce applications even though you're inevitably maybe running one for maybe a bookstore or something so how, how can you possibly take this in my opinion it sounds like a pretty gargantuan task what what are some takeaways and, and what what are the ways you can be successful I mean, we're, we're still always trying to figure that out. I, think, I don't think any organization in their equal secondary is ever going to be fully to give you a, a great, great answer on that. Um, you know, looking at, I'm going to say a lot of times the, with those services, where can you provide value? Where can you work with partners that, that will provide, you know, some of that security um, right off the hop? That, that's something, you know, like if you're dealing with e-commerce, you know, it, you can't be the, the pro in e-commerce, but you can do really well you know, with, with some internal resources and some, some partners that would come alongside you. So that's, that's things, you know, definitely I'm going to say, you know, working with partnerships is, is you know, a, a force multiplier that, you know, with, with post secondaries, because you've got that broad of range, um, realizing that there are some things that you, you'll have to just, I'm going to say, go deep on. You're going to have to get some really good headspace and knowledge, um, you know, not just in your cybersecurity team, but through your operations and and you know, if we're talking about software development, you know, making sure that there's there's a good understanding of of the the key issues right off the bat, and then continue looking at the genesis of where's the next thing to 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 shore up. In terms of regulatory requirements, I'm very ignorant on this on this side of things. But from a post secondary institution, what are the most common regulatory requirements or compliance requirements? Yeah, so definitely dealing with the the fight for fight back for privacy. Um, we deal with uh, PCI compliance for, you know, for any credit card transactions. Um, those are the two that really, you know, fall quite quite heavily on us. European Union GDPR compliance. Um, how, do, how do we deal with data? How do we deal with EU's constituents and, and their data and, and you, know, you know, the right to be forgotten and, and the, the different rights that come under the you know, GDPR? You mentioned to me that, that you can't necessarily be a master of, of every domain within uh, post-secondary, which is very understandable. Lean on partners when you can. Lean on maybe internal uh, resources, like internal champions on different teams, perhaps. Um, how do you decide, from your experience, when something should re should really require your attention or should deserve your attention to focus in and, and invest enough of your time to be part of your repertoire, rather than just offload it to a, a partner or a, an internal resource? It's definitely a continual process. I'm going to say a lot of it is is looking at so a lot of a lot of what we deal with well, and I think what most institutions and most or, uh, organizations deal with well is they deal with the traditional threats. They deal with you know there's always been malware around. They always you know mm. you know you've got an endpoint detection that's always been in place. It's it's now morphed into you know you're looking at identity and, and how to, especially you know looking at COVID nineteen and, and how that's changed where the work workforce is working. You're no longer sitting in you know a silo where you, you have, or, or a place where you have everything protected on your corporate network. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's really changed now to, to, you know, to look at the different aspects. And I think what you're doing is you have to continue to look at where is, you know, keep, keeping the, keeping the ear to ground, where do you see cyber security changing and morphing? So it's going, watching a lot of webinars, um, mm -hmm. seeing a lot of, uh, reading a lot of news articles to see where new types of attacks and, you know, not just the, the traditional malwares, but you know, this is what's happened and, you know, the, the deep fakes, for example, and, and with voice and things like that, that you have to continue to think about, well, this is the next place we need to. It's going to be a, an informal assessment because so many of these things change so quickly, but mm -hmm. doing an, an informal assessment, of, this is where we see some of the things happening. This might be applicable to us. Do we need to, you know, invest in this or you know, what's, what's the investment look like? Maybe that ties in well to uh, threat intelligence or some of the collaboration you'll get with other post-secondaries in the future, right? If, if all of the other institutions are being hit with X, well, maybe that's something we should brush up on, uh, uh, right? That kind of thing. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely that, that communication is going to change how we do things that way. Very cool. All right, we're gonna shift focus now to talk a little bit more around how you've handled taking on what would effectively be 
Greenfield Security Program, what that path looks like, maybe some mistakes or some failures that you've stumbled, stumbled across along the way, some successes. We're going to get into hopefully all of that stuff. This For me, this is a really exciting topic because uh, it's really a very interesting position for someone to be in, right? There's not that many, you know, program or organizations out there who maybe don't have a security program, at least in place to some degree. Um, and I'm sure, maybe, you know, maybe prior to you coming in, Bo Valley had, you know, something still there, but maybe not a very formalized program, right? Um, so you know, you're, you're put in a very interesting position, a very, very cool position. Um, and I think a lot of us would probably benefit from just hearing about some of these things. I made the assumption that it was a fairly um, bare program to some degree, a very blank slate. Is that a correct assumption? And uh, what resources did you first lean on to kind of build up that program over this last year? Um, first thing I say, yeah, like as, as you kind of alluded to, you know, that, that the, the opportunity to have there is great. I, I wake up every morning and go, my, my job is cool. You know, what I get to do and how I get to, you know, work with all sorts of different stakeholders and technical issues and that it's, it's really cool because there, there is no one day that, it's the same to the next, you know, it definitely, definitely changes. Um, the one thing I'm going to say about Greenfield, and, and if, if you look at, I, I'm going to say the notion that there, there never is truly a 100% Greenfield situation. Because, and the reason why I say that is because um, every, basically every organization, even if you're a new organization, you have these preconceived notions about what security should look like for your organization. You know, whether you're you know, a bakery to a cybersecurity shop, you know, where they're doing managed services. Um, so there's always that kind of notion of, of this is what it should look like. And they built on the, the experience of those that'll, that'll be in those roles. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I've been given the, the definitely unique opportunity that we went from, you know, being non-formalized mm -hmm. in, in, in a cybersecurity role and in cybersecurity office within um, IT to, to, you know, now having that formalized um, the interesting thing was, was state, definitely stakeholder engagement. That's something that, you know, we had done very operationally and, and definitely hanging off the operations of IT um, to try to see how and, and really showing how cybersecurity can provide value. Um, so that was, that was an interesting thing is, is hitting this, the, this, the stakeholders to build off that, that kind of, I'm going to say blank slate in, in where we're going as a strategy. but. Then, then also pivoting to, to realizing that because we had done IT, uh, IT security operationally for so long, that base, we were looking at things very much at a tactical level. Um, so the, the, the really cool opportunity here was the executive allowed me to create a, a cyber strategy uh, about where, you know, where we're going to go with our cybersecurity, what are the, the main pillars for us, and you know, what are the things that, that really drive us, and, and basically match that up with what already pre-existed, the things that we knew you know, inherently by doing operations, you know, as a school for well over 40 years, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the things that we're like, we knew we were doing this, but now we actually have a strategy that, that aligns with that. And now we can take what we've done now and, and kind of push that forward. So it was, when you took on this more formalized role, how did your priorities change, uh, if at all, when, when that, uh, that transition took place? It was it was definitely a, a transition of deoperationalizing my my role in a lot of aspects. You know, a lot of things that I had done over the years. And I think anybody that that is at an organization for several years, you you start to do work and, and do things that you know that that, that have operational value in that, and it's, it's things that you you're used to, and things you have to kind of let go. <laughs> so talking about you know, for my last role was database administration, getting out and, and, and out, out of the operational side of that, and then realizing that there's new operations that I need to be looking at, and looking specifically at cyber, and that's cyber operations. I'm going to say when, when this form, more formalized program was created, and I assume you had executive level sponsorship, and to this point, are you, are you still being backed by that executive team to continue forward with your strategy? Yes, um, so I, I would get to report directly to executive front through our CIO. Nice. Um, it's been great because I, I have a, a, what, what feels to be a great working relationship with many of our, our, our executive team. Okay. And actually what I've seen is, is a hunger to see, they, they've seen where we have gone in, in the last year and, and want to mature on that and you know, work harder to, be, to do better in, in a lot of spaces. So it's, that's, that's been a great thing to, to see is that, you know, being able to, to work to talk with executive as stakeholders that way. You're not necessarily having that genuine 
sponsorship from the executive team. You know, there's a lot of institutions out there, not, not even just public sector, but even private sector, you know, they, executive team realizes, yeah, we probably should have a cybersecurity program. So let's hire a bunch of people and keep them busy. But, you know, maybe they don't really genuinely care because it, it's more of a compliancy thing than anything, right? But it doesn't sound like that's the case at all. Yeah, I, I'm going to say it's actually quite interesting is, is a lot of the, the, the informal research that happens in where it is I get a lot of feedback actually directly from executives saying, hey, look, there's this, this issue that we see happening in, you know, or, you know, post-secondaries in, you know, Europe or, you know, we've seen this happen here. What are we doing about it? So it's, it's really good. You know, they're, they're, they're making sure that my nose is to the grindstone that I'm, I'm following up on these things. Oh. And they're actually providing some, some really great insight and input. Uh, since this program has been more formalized and you've, you've taken the reins, what, uh, if anything, would you say have, you could categorize as to some quick wins uh, that perhaps you've been able to implement or uh, in collaboration with other teams you've been able to implement? Is there anything that kind of fits that category? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm going to deal with real, I mean, multi-factor authentication is definitely really still relatively new to a lot of verticals as, as much as, you know, it's, it's been talked about and it's been, you know, technology has been there for a couple of years. It's still something that a lot of organizations have really shied away from. Um, so definitely when we're looking at protecting the, the identity and protecting the person, getting multi-factor in front of what I'm going to say, the crown jewels uh, of, of security and, and, and looking at them, try and look at them as intelligently as possible you know, looking at risk-based, you know, risk-based multi-factor authentication, making sure that, you know, the, the, the control fits what the actual situation is. So you're doing you know, very strong conditional access. Um, that's, that's definitely where we focused and, and we've had some really good success in the last year. We've been doing uh, phishing awareness campaigns and, and cybersecurity campaigns. I'm definitely getting into that and, and doing a lot more, a lot, a lot harder um, situations. So you're getting away from the, the Nigerian Prince scenarios to something a little bit more sophisticated and, and really a focusing on different business units and what it means, what, what a, an attack, a directed attack might look like for them. So definitely working at that. And then as well, also making sure that we have a baseline uh, cybersecurity awareness program that, so all, all end users have that basic knowledge of these are the, the main facets that you should be looking at when you're dealing with your normal operations. So far in your experience, what have been some of the best ways to get that buy-in from your colleagues, your peers? Uh, we all know in, in some organizations, people probably have had a bad experience working with a security team because maybe they've been really, really by the book. Maybe they, they haven't really taken that business context. They don't have that same empathy um, that we talked about a little bit earlier. So what are some of the ways you've used to, uh, to really create that buy-in? I'm going to say it's back to that talking about empathizing, um, you know, really understanding what, you're, what's, what matters to your stakeholders. So, you know, talking about, you know, with, with business and, you know, budget, this is what you know, a breach would mean to us if this happened, or if we, you know, invest in this technology to solve this problem, this is what, you know, the, this is the cost and this is what we're saving if we do this or we, we change to do that. Um, so really speaking the language of, of, you know, where, what that risk is and what that means for them it takes a lot of, um, I'm going to say understanding because sometimes we'll leave that a specific, you know, organizational unit is looking at security from the aspect of, you know, maybe it's just strictly intellectual property and you're totally wrong and it was a different facet. So it's, it's you know, that continual process is, is definitely what what takes that. But it's, yeah, definitely trying to empathize with the stakeholders and make, make them understand why this thing works for them with the, the priorities that they have. That last point you just made is very key, priorities. So you've obviously, you have some level of executive buy-in already, which is, obviously the, the first step to make any of this really happen. So how do you, how do you adjust or influence priorities in any way? If for example, you, you realize, Hey, this, this is a real problem. You've identified a real problem. Now you take that to the manager of team X who doesn't really care about that problem. He's got a list of 10 different things that he needs to work on. How do you, how do you manage that and influence your priorities to jive with his? Yeah, I mean, and some people use the analogy of the carrot and the stick. And I mean, what I've talked about mostly is trying to be using the carrot first, definitely in that that instance. And as as sad as, sad as it sounds, you know, cybersecurity still has to have that um, 
sometimes the the, the stick a little bit where hmm. where you, you you know there are things that we have to do for compliance reasons and there are things that we have to do you know that that don't seem pretty to them so so as much as possible try to have a, that open line of communication with if you know it's that that manager that has these different set of priorities than what the cybersecurity is and and you know having that conversation a lot of times just having that that communication channel opens that up and, and deals with you know 95 to 98 percent of the the issues that you have that way and the only issues then you're normally dealing with is this you know looking back to compliance and and things that you know absolutely are, are you know i'm gonna say that the more draconian things that you still have to do with security sometimes one of the topics that i'm particularly interested in and i'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on it uh, as part of you know you building a greenfield program is asset management so asset management is not sexy. It's not particularly attractive for anybody to tackle. And for most organizations, it's actually probably too large or too scary of, a, uh, of an initiative. Where, where does that fit in your list of priorities? What, what's your general opinion on asset management? And is that something you see as a realistic uh, goal to, to target? Um, yeah, I would say asset management is huge, and it's key, and it's really key to vulnerability management. And like, they really, you know, bounce off one another. So, you know, having the, the vulnerability management doing the validation of, you know, your assets and what you have, and 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 that. So, asset management, I definitely think is seems more as an operational, IT operational task. But the 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 background of that is is that gives you from the cybersecurity aspect, you you have that understanding of what you have where and what you need to protect. So when you first took on the, the new role in the, taking on the lead of the cyber cybersecurity program, was there anything in particular that you wanted to tackle first? Um, so is there anything that came to mind, you know, now that you've taken on this new role, I got to do this. Um, and if so, was that a feasible undertaking? So when, when we first created the, the strategy and, and then we were looking at, you know, our, our one to three year plan, um, is definitely I, I came up with a, with a quite a or came up with, with quite a large list. It was about 35 initiatives, wow. and, and realizing that you know if we hit 30 to 40 percent of them, we're doing really well. I, I know in our first year we we hit about 20 um, percent. So it was it was something that as we were transitioning and growing, you know, in, into this, it's, it's definitely changed. And so we're looking forward. To things for me was was definitely around again that identity management, talking about multi-factor authentication. That was huge thing for us because especially the, the systems that we were you know protecting you, you're seeing a tendency definitely more to be more and more cloud-based more and more just online co consistently online services mm -hmm. and so we need to make sure that the identity is being protected no matter you know whether uh, you know you have instructors you know doing instruction here or remotely so it's actually worked really and really well to the the current situation with you know with COVID-19. Cool so that was one of the first initiatives or one of the very first things that came to mind that, hey, this, this is something we really got to gotta get this done. Absolutely. And then we, we've been looking at vulnerability management for quite some time and we have, have been dealing with, you know, asset management, but doing that continual process of, you know, there, there's, there's always that hygiene of, of maintaining those, those endpoints and making sure that they're secure and, and that you're validating that. And so that was definitely another point where we were really focusing towards and, and, and can, we will continue to do so, of course. We, we do hear to some degree, the more formalized targets of maturity, for example. In my conversation with Brett, we talked a little bit about a scale from one to five that organizations can typically measure themselves with. Is there a, even if it doesn't fall within that scale, even if it's just some abstract concept, do you have some level of a maturity target that in mind, uh, let's say for the next three years? Yeah, I would say we, some of the things that we've been doing are going to be in that two to three range right now. And some things definitely that we've just started in the last year that will be, you know, weren't on the radar. They now become a one, a two. Um, I, I would say that would be foolish to think that we could get to, you know, fives or get to fives across the board. Where I would like to see in the two to three year range is being that 3.5 to 4.5 range consistently across all the means. Uh, do you have a rough idea or have you already gone through the process of mapping out what it would take to get to kind of this end goal of, of where you'd like to take the security program there? Yes, we've, we've gone through a maturity assessment. So against the framework, so we've had, had some, some knowledge about the things that we, we thought were where we thought it was good to get an external view. Um, as well as, you know, looking at our strategy and, and that kind of that one to the year 
three year, you know, I'm going to say laundry list uh, of things that we, you know, that we could see ourselves, you know, working back to the, to the strategic goals and that and, and making sure that those are definitely re mature and repeatable. From the more formalized cybersecurity frameworks, um, you know, like the NISTs of the world, are, are there any that you follow or you're trying to adhere to or you've built your program around? Yeah, so we, we do, I mean, I mean, other than dealing with regular try, we do try to, on our infrastructure, use the, the CIS benchmarks. Okay. So not, not the controls, but the, the benchmarks. And then as well, we are, are looking to adhere to, to NIST fully. So again, it's, it's really interesting because when you look at NIST, the NIST CSF and, and that it's, it's really the, it's, it's funny because before you would ever read through the framework, it's, it's, a, it's a real you know, kind of common sense. This is how you would handle things in security and, and it's just putting that in, into a, a definitive, sorry, definitive practice. Yep. Very cool. When it comes to business continuity, disaster recovery, those are often overlooked in most organizations. Um, and then sometimes they end up falling under the, the security domain. Um, I'm curious, is that, is that the case for, for you? Is, is business continuity inside of your purview? Uh, and if so, where does that rank in your list of priorities? So for us, our, our business continuity and, and disaster recovery actually was very, very matured. Um, oh, awesome. I mean, because, and I say we, we had the, the incidents of you know, flooding in, in 2013. Uh, you know, so that became definitely to the forefront for us. So it was more of an IT operational task. Okay. And so when we're looking at then from cybersecurity, a lot of those tactical things that we've been dealing with have been dealing with, you know, how do we deal with, you know, a ransomware attack if, you know, say, for example, drives get compromised. Well, what do we do with that? You know, so we're looking at things like that operationally and, and tactically beforehand. Uh, cybersecurity stepping into that now is, is really, I'm going to say, a lot lighter uh, view of that, which is which I'm going to say I'm, I'm happy for because there's, for the most part, it's, it's an operational task. That makes your job a little easier. Thankfully, there's already an yes, yes. initiative and, and I totally blanked on that for a second but yeah the the floods in 2013 that uh i think before that not many organizations had a real good if any business continuity plan and suddenly uh, the year after everybody had uh, a business continuity plan and especially anybody in the downtown core an initiative that i i, I don't see many organizations actually practice at this point um, i'm curious if if you have any opinions on uh, data classification. So that's a pretty large and uh, broad domain. From a Greenfield program perspective, of course, you know, if, if all the stars aligned, that would be great to have something like that, especially with all of the data that a institution like a BBC would have. Uh, where does that sit on your, your roadmap, if at all? Yeah, so I mean, when we're talking about data classification, I'm going to back up and talk about, you know, data governance. And it's been interesting because there's so much, many different types of data um, within a post-secondary that, you know, the, the the ownership and the stewardship is, is something that's really quite strong. I know it's something that we've been working on for several years trying to, to get right. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of that's, that's you know, led to, you know, it's it's that, that going to be that good to great wheelhouse kind of flywheel motion where, you, where you, you start doing these little you know projects and programs and and that and trying to get the the classification and understanding where where your data is how you protect it how you deal with it um you know from an actually strictly was from an operational standpoint first and and that has been has taken several years what i'm looking at for data classification now is i'm really looking at um you know especially around cloud-based infrastructure is is how we can classify our data that makes sense that we're, we're when we're dealing with it no matter if it's in transit at rest um that where we're looking at, at information protection so making sure that you know that's the sensitive data that 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 you know whether it's classifying data you know based on you know the the requirements that are regulatory requirements mm -hmm. or based on you know the the individuals that are accessing it and the individuals are used to, using that we're looking at it kind of from a couple aspects and hope to within the next couple of years really strongly classify around that so we can then start putting some some additional safeguards and rules around how that data gets gets transmitted and 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 moved around safely because of the FOIP requirements that, that probably would have mandated some level of data governance. So I didn't even think about that, but that's probably why you guys are so far ahead. Is that correct? I, I think part of that, I think it's part of, of good stewardship from, from all business units. I'm going to say kudos again to, to a lot, so many people that I work with across the organization that realizing that 
we have this it's that we need to protect because it's it's so many stakeholders that that, that rely on us you know for their privacy for you know provision of services uh, for their research for, for for many other different things here that you know that's that's really where we need to 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 make sure that we're, we're handling it and, and dealing with it in the best way possible that's amazing that's that's really good to hear so you know as we already both know each organization is going to have different priorities um, on a case-by-case -case basis on an organizational level on a broad level uh, being somewhat generic but what what advice would you give somebody who was perhaps in the same position that that you were given starting more or less the, the very beginnings of a formalized security program what, what advice would you offer that person um, I would say if you're if you're kind of like heading into it that be hungry um, don't think of any task as being below you there's going to be so much experience that you'll learn in just the the operational tasks and and the the knowledge that you'll get from you know from doing development for example or doing sysops you know you know if, if i didn't have that i wouldn't have had the view that i have with security now the other side of it is is be willing to to realize even after you've got that certification or you've got that that degree or diploma whatever it may be that you're going to be looking at you know continual schooling the way i look at it and the way i, I keep track of it is i've done probably over my career but four to six times the amount of courses that I ever took formally. Uh, since you've taken over this, this responsibility for the, the security program, if you're able to or comfortable to share, what would be perhaps some of the biggest mistakes or failures perhaps that you've made? Uh, you know, maybe you were naive about how easy something would be, or maybe you thought you had more buy-in than you really did. Is there anything that kind of fits that category? I'm going to say with the resource and, and time scarcity is is real, realizing that you know sometimes an incident's going to come up and you're going to have to deal with that and and where you thought you'd be strategically might might be thrown off by you know a day a week however it may be um, so so the, the naivety about that I mean part of that is is you know maybe trying to overachieve with that mm. uh, look at a healthily pessimistic view of, of what you can achieve um, and then you know. Try, you know, shoot, you're, you're definitely going to do that. Try to, I would say, try to shoot for the moon and realize that you're going to hopefully land among the stars. If that's, you know, to, to use a little bit of a of a saying there, but um, basically, you know, try try to to make sure you understand these are all the things that we have. We know that we're not going to achieve them. Look at them, even though you might look at them and say, oh, that, yes, I want to do every one of those. You, you got to be, you got to be a little less naive. And I even I'm talking about myself here that. You know, you're not going to get everything completed. You're not going to get everything started, even sometimes, with, with some of those initiatives. Yeah, that's good advice. I think a lot of people could probably, if I had to guess, become very discouraged. You know, you're maybe not able to get as much done as you were hoping. Maybe you thought you had more buy-in, you had more uh, executive sponsorship. So why aren't these things moving as quickly as you were hoping? Yeah, like like you just said, right? That's maybe not. Not the reality maybe your your list of priorities just doesn't quite match up with with everyone else's so uh, and, and personally personally look at you know keep a tally kind of for yourself of the wins that you have made because you know i looked at you know when i talked about you know 20 percent of what i was trying to accomplish got got accomplished but when i look at what got accomplished that that 20 percent there's there's a lot of items in there and there's a lot of things that wasn't on the list that that got accomplished so james you um took some level of a leadership role with respect to B-Sides Calgary. So you and I had some conversations last year when all of, uh, all of this was still a go and we were doing a lot of planning and things were, things were gearing up and everybody was getting excited. Obviously we've had some changes, um, but first and foremost, I'd love to know how you got involved in B-Sides Calgary. What was the motivating factor for you? How did you get recruited or how did you get, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's the right word, but how did you get thrown this responsibility? I, I always joke, and this is just, you know, tongue in cheek, but, you know, it's like being in front of a firing squad and everybody just, you know, until <laughs> everybody but one takes one step back, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of what it, but it is. But we were actually was, was approached over a year ago about um, being potential partner institution. Just mm. this was a perfect place for, you know, kind of central to, for corporate as well as, you know, post-secondary. I could see, you know, moving into the new role and, that I was I had moved into, and seeing kind of the, you know, from I'm going to say from the late layman's or foundation on our IT operational side of things, where you know I could see things be of value. Mm -hmm. 
And so really, you know, the, the, the big thing that came out of that then was and where I really strongly wanted to kind of move into was again the community involved and in making sure that the, the community from everywhere from you know especially from the lens of being a post-secondary that students to to staff and faculty you know get involved and, and get their eyes open to, to the cybersecurity. You always see the stats about how many cybersecurity roles you know the, the world is shy of and, mm-hmm. and getting those people connected is, is definitely was the, the big thing that, that drove me to want to be, be involved. So the question um, that I'm sure is, is on everyone's mind is where, you know, given the state of the world we're in right now, and, you know, we've, we've seen that uh, at least a recent announcement from the Edmonton B-Sides team was that they're going to move to a, a virtual format, I believe, this fall. Um, so where do we stand with uh, B-Sides Calgary 2020? If you have if you even added liberty to discuss that yet, uh, are we still thinking or are we on track for a live delivery? Or are you guys leaning towards more of a virtual format? Yeah, so I mean, right now it's, it's still definitely in flux. I mean, the, the, we look at or looking at it continually. Um, we haven't. We've we've kind of got some some dates in mind that potentially we're hoping for. We're hoping definitely still be in this year in, in 2020. Um, looking at you know just just the situation where we're not 100% certain if we'd be able to do that in a in an in-person environment or if that would be even a responsible thing to do. So that's what we're still trying to, to deal with. The flip side of it is we don't want, you know, the, the event to be just, you know, given that it has, to, you know, if it's, if it's not an in-person event, how do we make that um, definitely something that, you know, bridges that physical virtual divide and is, is definitely more engaging mm-hmm. and gets the community factor. Cause that's, that's my concern is that, you know, if, if you're in, in a webinar or a set of webinars for a full day, you know, the, the community aspect really can, can suffer. So we're really trying to make sure that that's, you know, we're looking into some, some technological options and crossing with some, you know, creative options that hopefully for this, we're hoping that, you know, this isn't a longer term thing, but, you know, for at least for this year, that, that that's something that we're going to be looking or trying to track towards. We're hoping to, to, to engage hopefully within this year. Cool. Yeah. I know for, for all of us, there's probably a lot of pressure on you, but uh, yeah, we're all, I mean, I'm, I would hope anyway, we're all very empathetic to the situation. It's only so much you, you guys can do as the, as the, the committee for, for B-Sides Calgary, right? You can't, can't uh, create a vaccine and, and all of a sudden put everybody together in a room. We all would, of course, love to be together in a physical room and a physical um, location. But I mean, as you said, right, is it the responsible thing? Does it make sense? Those are all factors you have to consider. Um, I know for me personally, with, with respect to these webinar type uh, events, it can be very grueling, can be hard to keep, get engagement. Um, but yeah, there's there's some creative ways as, as you guys are probably already investigating to, to try to make that happen, right? Whether it's spread across more more days, less hours per day, I'm, I'm sure there's many things to consider. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful that you guys are still, uh, still willing. Those of our viewers who would like to, for whatever reason, get in touch with you. Maybe they've been inspired as a result of this interview. They really like your passion. They want to pick your brain about something. Do you have a preferred way for them to reach you? Is it maybe through LinkedIn, Twitter? Through LinkedIn is the best for sure. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So you guys can look for James Cairns. Just look for the Lord of the Rings photo and that'll be, uh, that'll be your guy. All right, everybody. So thanks very much, James, for uh, joining us on our second episode of A Slice of Security. Today, we spoke about all things related to cybersecurity, responsibilities, and priorities in a post-secondary institution. And we also talked to James quite a bit around cybersecurity program that he's helping build at uh, his current employer. Um, Some of the challenges, some of the successes and triumphs uh, that came about. And I just want to say thanks very much for joining us on this episode, James. It was a real pleasure. I had a lot of fun talking to you. This episode, we also reviewed Boston Pizza. We had the El Dorado. I uh, I do look forward to B-Sides 2020 in whatever form it may come about. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy being on here. Thank you for watching A Slice of Security. Please hit that subscribe button. And also don't forget to turn on notifications to ensure you're notified of future episodes and content. Also, don't forget to comment with your answers to this episode's questions, as well as provide your feedback and any ideas for future topics, content, or pizza reviews.